Okay, and a reception of visitors, 2.1, agenda 2.1A, MHS, Lift of Franklin Preschool Leadership Symposium Presentations. Great. Quite used to being like at the beginning. Dr. Hill. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting over there relaxing for a second. Okay, so we have a few guests. I know I've got one very special guest and mom here tonight. Um, we're going to share with the board some exciting recognition that Matching School District got. And um, uh, early last month, the beginning of March, we were asked to attend a symposium, which is a national conference that talks about student leadership and systems alignment. Um, and so the following four topics were asked to be presented presented in Washington, D.C. So we had a um, Franklin Preschool presentation, and Cody helped with that. We had a matching high school presentation with some student leaders. We had a lift presentation, and we had an alignment presentation. And so Kobe is going to um, tell us a little bit about what did you... <laughs> well, how about this? So who's this? Up there, do you recognize that? Okay, oh, well, <laughs> what was your what was your leadership role while you were there? Do you remember what your job was? Okay, oh, yes, look, he was a door treater and he created our very own Mr. Stewart. <laughs> you I do too, along with hundreds of other people. So he was not shy at all. He stood at the door and there were hundreds of people coming in to learn about what our preschool is doing to develop such great leaders and to teach the seven habits and to work with families. So along with Kobe, he had his own little team here. You can see of um, the team members who went and presented and got tons of fantastic feedback. So he did a really great job. <laughs> <laughs> So he had some other friends, the Lyft team went as well, and our student leaders who presented fantastically. Um, both Jason's goes to and Jocelyn's Spicer. Jocelyn's one of our Martinsville students. Um, McLean, is there anything you want to comment on about that experience? Here they are uh, doing their thing in a room full of people, just. Yeah, um, they did an excellent job, and um, just examples of uh, student leaders sharing the story of Lyft and leadership, and how they're growing in their own leadership and it was inspiring when you had another high school that was in there um, who chose their session to come and learn from from our leaders at Lyft. It was a really, uh, really great presentation. Yeah, I love um, high school students in the Washington DC area who were asking questions and they were exchanging information. And I was just so impressed with the professionalism of the students for the Lyft presentation and also matching high school. So matching high school's presentation was on uh, student leadership and the, and the sense of belonging at a high school level, which is really an interesting and compelling topic right now. Um, and so our high school is just a, a beacon when it comes to that. And so this was the presentation team. Our student leaders there, um, both Jay, both Jalen and Leah did an incredible job along with the team here. We've got Tara and Rich here tonight, I know for sure. And all of our students are also involved in a million things. Like, didn't they just also wrap up the baseball game like 20 minutes ago? Um, so they couldn't all be here tonight. But high school team, is there anything you'd like to add about that experience? Here they are. Not, you can see how many people came to listen. Yeah, uh, it eventually filled up and we some, had some standees in the back. Uh, the students did a, a wonderful job. And one of the things that I'm most proud of is that we're very authentic and real. And so while we recognize the things that we do really well, 
we also honestly talk about like where we're not where we want to be and how we can get there and so said uh, student leaders right there are be talking at our april faculty uh, meeting about hey what are things that we can do to take our performance to the next level get even more students involved and help them see that their voice is listened to and matters at the high school our fourth and final presentation was on district systems and the all access pass. So the way that we've organized our committee work and leadership work all the way from preschool up through the high school. Um, and so the topics here were on district alignment uh, and board members, you know about how we have our district systems team. Several of you were on those. We teach seven habits from the time we partner with families from birth through three all the way through high school. We have systems teams and we use the goal setting process of four disciplines of execution. Um, so really it was a huge compliment that we were invited to do that. These are the people who were able to participate in that, uh, in those presentations. Lots of contact information has been shared. We continue to give a lot of tours. <laughs> a lot of people want to see the great things that are happening and um, there were lots of questions about the board and how the support from the board has been sustained and how you guys are seeing those efforts pay off in our student leaders and um, the way that our results are starting to become more aligned. So we'd be happy to answer any questions and I don't know if we went ahead and left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what, he was a trooper. He did a fantastic job along with all of our students. So lots to be proud of. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Who's next? Okay, moving on, we have no non-agenda visitors. Next is Consent Agenda Board Action 3.1 to approve uh, approval of minutes, 3.1A Regular Board Meeting, March 14, 2023, 3.2 Financial Payment of Bills, 3.2A Presentation of Bills for Approval, 3.2B Monthly Financial Reports by Fund, 3.2C FY23 Budget to Date Report, 3.3 The Enrollment Report, 3.4 Approval of MHS Student Council to attend the Illinois Association of Student Council's State Conference May 4th through the 6th, 2023 in Lombard, Illinois. 3.5 Approval of MHS JROTC Leadership Challenge Summer Camp June 5th through the 9th, 2023 at the Marcellus National Guard Training Center in Marcellus, Illinois. And 3.6 Freedom of Information Report. On the motion, please. Motion. Dale, I'm sorry, second by Erica, roll call please, Kelly. Kathleen? Yes. Larson? Yes. Overton? Yes. Ryder? Yes. Weaver? Yes. Hedges? Yes. Okay, moving on. Reports and recommendations of the business manager. All right. I got it today. All right. I'm not sure which one. <laughs> he gets all the stuff where we get money. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're getting easing into it. All right. So, first one is board action to approve registration and extracurricular fees for 23 24 school year. Um, student breakfast and lunch. Again, this is going to be at no cost to the students. Uh, the CEP program received school board approval in September of 2020. The program provides breakfast and lunch to all students at no cost. Within or their families. We received reimbursements from the government to pay for this program. And this has been a great benefit to our community and to our families throughout the district. Uh, it takes place at Riddle and Williams at the middle school and at the high school. Franklin is not eligible for this program, so they have other programs to, to deal with their food service. Um, we experience an overall increase in revenue for our attendance centers based on this and at no expense to our, our families. And we plan on doing this program at no cost as we move forward in the next school year as well. Uh, the one change that is in the slide from this year to next year is uh, our adult prices. And this, these are the ones that are recommended by ISBE. And we need to be in compliance with these to stay eligible for CEP. So that would be a uh, adult lunch would go from $3 to $4.50. Adult breakfast from $2 to $2.65. And the price of milk from 40 cents to 60 cents. So that's what the I ISB says we need to do to be in compliance. So that's what I'm going to ask you to vote on here in a little bit. 
Um, we want to keep all of these fees what they've been the last two or three years. Uh, driver's ed fee at $55 at the high school. Uh, instructional materials for <coughs> Riddle Williams, the high school and the middle school at $55. District-wide athletic fees, $35 per sport. No student can pay more than $70 in a year, and no family can pay more than $140 in a year. So they've remained the same since the 2018-2019 school year. So my recommend, or our, our recommendation as administration is board action to set the fees for the 23-24 school year as presented. Need a motion, please? Motion. By Erica? Second. Second by Ashley. Roll call, please. Larson? Yes. Overton? Yes. Ryder? Yes. Weaver? Yes. Hedges? Yes. Kepley? Yes. All right, the next one where Jenna receives the money. So, 4.2, board action to accept a $900 donation from the Matching Police Department. The money will be used to support the Franklin School Backpack Program. So, that's really all I have on that. <laughs> And need a motion, please. Motion. By Ashley, second by Dell. Any discussion? I'd, I'd just like to clarify one thing. It's not from the police department per se. It's from the uh, union that represents the officers that work here. Thank you. Sorry, no problem. Anything else? Roll call, please, Kevin. Overton? Yes. Ryder? Yes. Weaver? Yes. Hedges? Absolutely. Kepley? Yes. Larson? Yeah. Right. Mr. Schaefer, you want to help us with these? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so tonight uh, we got a request uh, to accept a donation from Graphic Packaging International. I have the privilege of uh, leading some of their representatives through Lyft on a tour, and um, just like a lot of our um, great partners, they decided to partner with us in the following way for to help students and offset their tuition costs. Um, outlet. So tonight we have uh, John McLeod here, who's here to present a, a check, a representative of a graphic plant manager of Graphic Action International. So, um, yeah, do you have any, anything to, to share? Well, um, you know, I, I think that first of all, um, kind of passionate about the whole educational process, and I think that you know, educating our children, you know, for their future is the most important job in our universe. And I think as we see education evolve into what it is today from what it was 10 years ago. I think the LIFT program is, is kind of the epitome where, where the educational system is probably headed someday to give every student a, a fair opportunity to do something that, that they're passionate about. And so we're excited to be a part of this. It's, I think it's a privilege to be a part of this and uh, uh, we, we know it's an important um, part of society but also very important to the businesses to, to come in our future and you know, kind of what makes us who we are. So, you guys got a lot to be proud of. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, you like yeah. a picture yeah. with yeah. them, please? donation that we would like to ask the board to approve tonight is uh, with the, the National Electric Contractors Association. So working with Commercial Electric and Mark O'Dell and his team, we're putting contact with um, uh, NECA and their associates at tonight. Bill is here to represent um, the union. We're just so thankful that they would like to make a donation to put toward um, the electrical program for training aids for that. So again, another example just great partners that really believe in um, what's happening in our region, what's happening with kids, and we're just beyond thankful. So, um, Billy, do you have uh, anything to add? <clears throat> I would echo a lot of this gentleman's comments. I think what you guys are doing here is extraordinary, providing opportunities for uh, individuals to become trained, job ready, essentially, being able to apply to apprenticeship programs, and giving them a leg up uh, to where they otherwise might not have. Uh, college isn't for everyone. Um, everybody's short um, of applicants, and I think that what you guys are doing here is uh, a great opportunity uh, for
for a lot of the you know local residents to 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 obtain opportunities to uh, provide a very good uh, living for themselves and their families. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I need a motion to accept by Ashley. Second. Second. Any discussion? I, I, if I'm not mistaken, with the um, first on graphic packaging, they chose the schools, correct? Yes, yes, they chose, they, they put in the, the schools they wanted to install. Very good. Anything else? Roll call, please. Ryder? Yes. Weaver? Yes. Hedges? Yes. Kepley? Yes. Larson? Yes. Overton? Yes. Okay, moving on. Back point one, we got rec uh, reports recommendations as the assistant superintendent. Thank you. Go ahead before then the April personnel report. Superintendent, we have certified resignation. Logan Cullen, resigning lift communications facility, a facilitator effective at the end of the 2023 summer school session. Uh, certified appointments, Kate Bush, Bushu rather, uh, Mexican High School Physical Education teacher effective 23 24 school year. Kurt Engenbrock, Mexican Middle School Dean of Students effective at the end of the 23 24 school year. Sylvia Gardner, uh, Williams Elementary School second grade teacher, effective for the 23-24 school year. Rebecca Kraft, matching high school instructional coach, effective at the beginning of the 23-24 school year. James McKee, matching middle school social science teacher, effective at the beginning of the 23-24 school year. Uh, Clayton Reed, Williams Elementary School fifth grade teacher, effective 23-24 school year. Continuing, Rachel Schwa, Franklin Preschool School Psychologist effective 23-24 school year. Alexis Spidel, Williams Elementary School, second grade teacher, effective 23-24 school year. And then we have two stu uh, substitute teachers, Jessica Elmendorf and Heidi Schaefer. Classified resignations, Emily Gurley, resigning Williams Elementary School, school secretary, effective April 7, 2023, and some classified appointments. Christina Cotet, uh, Williams Elementary School supervisor, effective beginning of the 23-24 school year. Lisa Endenbrock, um, Williams Elementary School Library for Professional Effective 23-24 school year. Christy Fritz, Franklin Preschool Parapro, Effective 23-24 school year. Uh, Sarah Carter, Little Leader Substitute, Effective Immediately. It's our uh, uh, daycare facility where it lived. And then we have an army of volunteers. <laughs> all those as uh, end of the year school field trips are occurring. So. <laughs> Uh, especially at the elementary school, so uh, very good. They're listed there as well. <laughs> Extracurricular extracurricular uh, resignations and um, you know, so resigns matching high school junior varsity dance coach effective immediately. And we have some extracurricular assignments. Colton Anderson recommending him priors matching high school assistant football coach effective beginning 2024 school year. Kate Bushu matching high school head cross country coach effective beginning 2324 school year. Alex Carey. Matching High School Boys Varsity Soccer Coach, effective 23 24 school year. James McKee, Matching High School Varsity Boys Basketball Coach, effective 23 24 school year. And Jason Morgan, Matching High School Varsity Girls Soccer Coach, effective 23 24 school year. In addition, we have an addendum. Classified Residations, Lisa Harlan Rowe, Middle Elementary School Supervisor, effective uh, April 11, 2023. Classified Appointments, Taylor. Beals, Matching High School Attendance sec Secretary, effective immediately. Alicia Carmen, uh, Riddle Elementary School Supervisor, effective immediately. Andrew Little, Substitute Custodian, effective immediately. Extract the resignations, Haley Miller, uh, uh, and <clears throat> resigning as Matching High School Dance Coach, effective immediately. And extracurricular uh, assignments, Haley Miller, again, Matching High School Junior Varsity Dance Coach, effective immediately. And Mr. McKay, uh, that, that uh, the middle school teacher and varsity basketball coach just want to make a note. It says um, where he is located is not in Ohio as on the agenda. It is Columbia, Missouri. 
So just want to make that note. We'll make that correction. In this. Are there any questions? See none, and I would ask the board to accept the personal report as presented. Motion, please. Motion. By Ashley. Any seconds? By Mr. Edges. Question. Go ahead. Are we moving to accept it as presented or as amended? Presented. Oh, with with I'm the sorry. correction. The, with the correction, the very correction. I thank you for the presentation. Any other questions or comments? Roll call, please. Weaver? Yes. Hedges? Yes. Kathleen? Yes. Larson? Yes. Overton? Yes. Ryder? Yes. Thank you. Okay, number six, reports and recommendations of the Assistant Superintendent for Student, student Services, Dr. Hill. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of really cool presentations for the board tonight. I think you'll be really excited to hear some things that have been going on. Um, the first is about our Global Leadership Day, which occurred on March 28th. This was our first time participating in this global celebration of service. And so we wanted to share the impact of that day with the board and the community. Um, so what is Global Leadership Day? Well, first of all, you all know Leader Me teaches the highly effective practices and paradigms associated with the seven habits of highly effective people, along with the eight habit, which is find your voice. It emphasizes the unique talents of individuals and the interests of all of the students and people who are part of our organization as well. So as a piece of that eighth habit, we think about service. How do you use your unique gifts to serve? So in the over 6,500 schools where Leader in Me is being implemented across 50 countries around the world, students, had an opportunity to use their unique talents to serve and help others. And we were able to participate in that. And just a quick aside, just noting that there's this many schools and that many countries participating and that our district had four uh, presentation requests. That's really, I feel like something to be very, very proud of. So Global Leadership Day gives us a really wonderful opportunity to see what happens when the unique talents of our leaders are matched with a need and how this next generation of leaders is going to change not only their schools and the community, but potentially the world. And so I get to share it with you today what happened on the 28th. Our projects focused on a combination of teamwork, being others focused, some selflessness, doing something for others that did not gain something for yourself necessarily, connection, building connections, and strengthening existing connections, and gratitude, a sense of gratitude. So you'll see those themes permeate in all of the work highlighted. So this is what our preschoolers did. Our three and four year old students served by partnering with the middle school students to clean up their butterfly garden. If you haven't been to the Franklin Butterfly Garden, these next few months are a beautiful time to go. Um, that was all designed by staff and helped impl implemented with middle school students last year and high school students as well. These little kiddos also created cards for our nursing homes and for our police officers, and they they planted flowers in the flower boxes. So here are just some pictures of that happening, some of the great stuff that happened that day um, over at Franklin. Our Williams student leaders performed a choir concert at a nursing home. They cleaned their school and the school grounds. They completed a bracelet project for Operation Christmas Child. They created community signs, Crafts for nursing homes, blessing bags to be taken throughout our community, flower packets for businesses, and community cards. They partnered with the library to create some bookmarks for patrons. That was Rachel's class that got to do that. And I should have noted, I'm just highlighting some of the projects. They're not even all on here. There were many, many more. So take a look at our Williams student leaders doing some cool things, um, all the way from decorating their own playground, inspiring, here they are at the nursing home doing all kinds of crafts and projects to help others. Our Riddle student leaders, their entire focus for Global Leadership Day was on first responders. So whatever project they picked was around that theme of thinking and honoring and learning about our first responders. So they specifically created cards. They did some thank you videos. They made you banners. They did crafts to decorate their office spaces. <laughs> And then they also learned about the role of first responders and the impact they have on the communities. Um, so it's also an opportunity for them to learn about those professions. Here are some pictures of those great things happening at Google. 
Our middle school students, they did all kinds of projects. We have lots of pictures, too, if you want to see. Um, they cleaned the grounds of the school, and they also cleaned the inside. You got a good picture of some scrubbing happening. <laughs> they painted the play areas on the blacktop to kind of offer opportunities for students to play Foursquare and other games that they want to have available. They partnered with preschool leaders. Um, that's one of my favorite things is kids helping kids, seeing um, the littles look up to the big kids, and the big kids get an opportunity to connect and build relationships. And they also created crafts and inspirational cards for people throughout the community. And here they are. I think I've got the locker picture on there. Yeah, here. Our high school students, oh my goodness, the list of projects was astounding. They utilized wave times for this, right? Tara, yeah, and Liz. Uh, wave times, so if, just to kind of refresh, or if people are um, new to the wave time concept, wave times are our morning kind of community concept at the high school where students are in a cohort for a multiple, multiple years with the same students and teachers, and they really build a family, um, sense of family in, in those spaces. Um, so those spaces, they, they each picked projects. They completed over 55 projects for the high school. They decorated the Othello Rebecca home. Um, they did more work at the animal shelter, which they loved on a really cold day this past fall. They did games, reading, they did projects with elementary students, they packed meals, partnered with them matching police and fire. They decorated the work area for their teachers, which I thought was awesome. They did that as a way to say thank you for them. And then they wrote lots of letters and thank you cards, cookies, and they built a library as well as a fence for the chickens. <laughs> um, they made blankets and gift bags, and really the list goes on and on. And I think what I love about this is you can also see the joy that comes in doing these projects. And we've heard that time and again since Green and Gold Day was started, how much our young leaders really enjoy serving and the, and the mutual benefit that comes from that. Those are lessons that they'll carry on past graduation. So um, Lyft also, they created and delivered gift boxes for first responders, and then you probably saw they had a drive-through lunch, and all the proceeds from that benefited St. Jude Children's Hospital. Here's that. District office, we had the opportunity to go to the Haven, and we prepared a spaghetti lunch um, and salad and dessert, and, um, and then we served lunch to residents there. And um, we've said, and Brian even commented, like that would be something that we'd like to do with more regularity. So let me just give you this impact data. This is really cool. We picked one day, and it wasn't even a whole day. Students still ran their schedules. They still had classes, and they gave a part of their day. And during that time, over 5,000 hours were donated to others. Um, 118 projects were completed, and over 12,000 people were touched in some way by that, by the work done by our student leaders. So it's something that I think as a community, as a kind of district, we should be really proud of. Any questions or principles, anything you want to add? Yeah. Yeah. So we've done great all day, you know, and, and you know, our high schoolers say, like, we wish we could do this more often, right? So then this opportunity came along, and we thought, well, this could be a good spring, a spring service project. So, and we were lucky with weather. It was a beautiful day. <laughs> <laughs> and all students were involved. Mm -hmm. Preschool all the way through. And Rich, you can speak to this on, on Green and Gold Day. Um, it's a crystal <laughs> point. Like, the extension of this has been feedback that we've received for a couple of years from staff. Um, at, at our elementary buildings primarily saying, hey, it's great to have 15 kids in a kindergarten classroom helping out. Um, but the, the greater impact is, is, as Christy alluded to, the connections that our students um, are making with younger students and looking up to older students. But Rich has also experienced the outreach from surrounding schools, um, asking, how do we pull this off? How do you put together these opportunities? Because we'd like to see that in our districts as well. So it's nice to uh, to have others surrounding, looking to see what we can do and how we can improve that. And here's a way that we can expand that to the spring uh, as well in the future. So great work to, to all the principals, uh, staff, and students as well. I did have a question. Do students have, and Rich, you might be able to answer this at the middle school or high school, do students have a, like a survey to follow up and like what would they like to oh, do? Oh, that's a really good question. I don't know if we did that with Green and Gold Day. Um, yes, 
Yep. Yeah. Okay. We okay. seek feedback every time and we make improvements. And every year that we've done it, we've involved more students in the planning of the event. Yeah, I will say one of the more powerful pieces, I mean, it's all pretty powerful when you think about it, but the amount of student voice, like asking, how do you want to help? What problem do you see that you have gifts to help solve? Those are like world changer type thinkers that we're creating, and they have great ideas. Beyond what all of our old brains can come up with it. <laughs> so, yeah, great question. Any other questions? Not, I don't have any action on that. I do have another presentation, which is another no action presentation, but really excited to be able to share this one as well. And it kind of goes to your question, Heidi, about um, following up, like what, how, how do we know when things are working? So I'm super excited to be able to share a program impact report. Again, no action. <clears throat> this is just to kind of share and update with some of the innovative practices we have going on in the district and what we're seeing as a result. So I wanted to open with just this this paradigm for for the board to, to have in the back of their minds. This is this is the position that we use whenever we're trying something new, right? So like this idea that we have the freedom to innovate, but it's bound by our responsibility to analyze the impact and then the intent to apply what we find. So it's great to innovate, and you have been, we have a super supportive board, and we have a very innovative staff. I mean, tons of great ideas. And what we try to do, and I've talked with Molly about this a lot, is when we innovate, we've really got to check to see what's the result of those innovations, and then the results have to lead to further action. Otherwise, it's just kind of like trying to win, right? And we're... We're in a very important business, as the gentleman earlier said. So when we try new things, we check to see what happens as a result, and then we make adjustments based on what we find. So tonight, we're going to be able to share program review in two areas, two innovations that we've had in place, um, one for a little bit longer than the other. We have some early findings that we want to share with the board and also just share with you kind of our next steps that are going to happen as a result of those findings. So the two innovations we're going to talk about tonight is multi-age programming at our elementary schools that began 2019 and goes till today. So we have a little bit longer stretch of data. Um, but the hard thing is all of these innovations happened like 2018, 2019, and then we have like two and a half years. Of <laughs> okay, now catch back up and let's do this again. So, so that 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 is we don't have quite the same amount of data as we normally would. And then a personalized paid math course at Matching High School. And we're looking at it as it's been designed this school year. We did some things last school year. We wanted to figure out how it was impacting kids. So then this year we designed a full scale study from the beginning of the year. So we're going to tell you kind of what we found. So let's start with multi age. So, first of all, what is multi age programming? So, multi age classrooms are classrooms of combined grade levels who work together over multiple years. So the same kids and the same teacher. So it's a cohort that moves together over more than one year and it has more than one grade level in the classroom. That's how we defined it for the purpose of this study. And then what's the purpose of multi-age programming? When we designed this from the onset, the why behind it was to increase relational trust due to sustained time with the same peers and teacher, to improve social learning and behavior, again, due to sustained time with peers and the same teacher, as well as older models, increase individual goal setting and group work due to expected varying levels. So I want to just elaborate on that for just a second. In every classroom in America, in all the classrooms in the matching schools, there are varying levels. We just have historically lumped them together and just said, well, you're third grade, so we're just going to teach you third grade. We've always known there are varying levels, right? And teachers do a fantastic job of trying to differentiate. What multi-age does is says, we are fully expecting these two levels. So you should be fully prepared and equipped to teach those two levels. So that's an important nuance. And then also to increase mastery learning over a multi-year period. So what this allows us to do is instead of coming to May and saying, see you later, great job, you get the percent that you earn, we, we don't stop. Like we pick up in August, wherever it was you left off in May, and it might still be in that same grade level's worth of learning, 
And as the teacher, I know that because I've had you, like, I was the one that's there doing the test with you. So that mastery learning is sustained over multiple years instead of just condensed over to nine, over nine month period. It also was designed to increase strengths-based leadership roles and mentoring between two grade levels um, because we are able to get to know our students' unique traits more deeply over a multi-year period. It also, another purpose of it when we first designed it was to balance class sizes. We had you know, not enough for another section of second grade, and our third grade was kind of big, and so that was another that was another reason for starting. So, what's the research base for that? Like, okay, cool idea. What gives you the right to try something like that? So, I've linked in here for the board and for the minutes or whatever they're posted. This is the research base that we leaned into when we thought about the design that included looping. Looping is the term for staying with the same teacher and kids for more than one year. That's called looping. Um, and then multi-age, which is sometimes called multi-grade or mixed grade. So we had a great research base that says, yes, this is good for kids. So, all right, well, let's see what happens here and what are the results. So this next section is going to talk about our results and huge thanks to Molly Hastings, who um, she and I love to talk about numbers and graphs and Excel spreadsheets, but we condensed all of it to like two charts <laughs> because we're talking like thousands of columns and rows and um, I understand that you need to get moving along. So, but seriously, like she's a whiz when it comes to analyzing all this stuff. We talk about questions and she's like, oh, we'll put it in this spreadsheet and crank it out. So this is what we found. We found, in terms of academic growth, that students in multi-age classrooms had higher average scores in reading and in math as measured by math tests. So, board, you're all familiar with that. It's been smart. We get it three times a year um, in grades all the way up through high school. So, students who were in this experienced higher average scores. On IAR, the classes as a whole score at or above grade, grade average. So that's another really promising academic result. What we also found was looping, we saw higher growth in students who are with the same teacher for more than one year. So just to kind of clarify that, we have some students who move out their second year, and we have some students who jump into that class in the second year. So the majority of the kids are together, but you've got a couple who move in or move out just because of moving in or changing classrooms. But the ones who are with the same teacher for more than one year, we saw higher growth. And as late as today, we analyzed a little bit more in actually Mr. Wheeler's classroom and another teacher who looped, and we found this to, to hold true. Um, so the looping really has a positive effect, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. So let me tell you what you're looking at here. The um, number on this vertical axis here represents RIT score. So RIT score is just like a number. It's basically like the score the kids get when they take the math test. And it's a vertical scale all the way from little to big. And then here, these are the classrooms or the, the grade levels, and there's double in some instances because we have real and Williams. So the school is taken away. That part doesn't matter. But what you're looking at here is a comparison of reading scores for students in multi-age classes, which is RIT, and scores for students who are in traditional classes, which is blue. So super positive, what you notice in no matter what class you're in, you have an upward trajectory, right? Like we're seeing growth, you want to see that. Um, but you can kind of see that there is a, there is a higher, um, there, it is higher in multi-age. Um, when we look at math, we see something very similar. Um, again, tracking up, that's great news, and our multi-age classrooms are just seeing a little bit, in some instances, a little bit higher score. That's RIT score. So that's just the number. The other thing MAP allows us to do is it sets a goal for every student. So like at the beginning of the year, you take a test and you get, let's just say you got 100. And it says the next time you take it, your specific goal should be 120. Your goal should be 115. Yours should be 150, right? So each student has an individualized goal. What this chart is showing us is how many students meet that goal, the specific goal for them. So we saw their score, but this is a specific, are they meeting their goal or not? 
And what you're looking at here is within multi-age, a comparison of looping, kids who had the same teacher more than once, compared to students who did not. They're in the multi-age program, but, but, they, but they did not have the same, same teacher. So what do you notice? Just what stands out to you? Yes, looping works. <laughs> yes, I mean, no, we're done, fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the blue bars tend to be higher, right? So we're seeing that students who are with the same teacher for more than one year will basically proving the research to be true, right? There are academic benefits to students staying with the same teacher. Um, and and in, in non-looping students, um, we still saw students meeting their goal. This is just to illustrate the difference if you were with the same teacher more than once. What's um, the gray lines? What's the gray lines are where that effect wasn't present. Oh, yes, Molly? Yeah. <laughs> so so you're, you have two because you've got, um, these all represent multi-age classrooms. So multi-age classroom, multi-age classroom, multi-age classroom, multi-age classroom. This one, that was not the case. The, the blue was not higher than red. The blue was not higher than red here, so they're not. So it's like five out of seven. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. So the other thing we we analyzed was beyond academics. What about SEL? Because we remember back one of our goals was like increased behavior. I know, isn't she cute? <laughs> increased behavior, leadership, those kinds of things. So we wanted to ask some qualitative questions about that. Um, so we did a student survey, and all students in the multi-age program report high levels of confidence, comfort with peers and their teacher, um, developing leadership, self and time management, and communication skills. So they all reported very high on that. Looping students rate, rated themselves higher. So the ones who looped within the multi-age had higher scores, um, especially in terms of reading confidence and the ability to ask for help or self-advocate and just being happy coming to school. Like the parent survey, overall very, very positive. Um, I think 95% of the parents said this was a great fit for their child. Um, the looping experience, they noted, decreases their anxiety that they've seen in their children before, increases their perception of being involved in their child's <coughs> education, and this was a cool piece. We saw increased satisfaction with the school as a whole. Like, how happy are you with the overall school, not just the classroom? So um, that was a, another piece that we looked at. The final piece of SEL data we looked at was Panorama. And in this data, grade three through five, they take it themselves. K through two is read to them. So we analyzed three through five. And we saw no difference, no discernible difference between students who are in multi-age and not. So same patterns there. What does this all mean? So as a result of what we've reviewed so far, we're not done. Um, we, we actually will continue offering this as an option. We saw that there was benefit to students having this as an option. Um, we'll look for natural ways to provide looping experiences in all of our programming. It was clear that the element that stood out as the huge difference maker, mm -hmm. more so even than having two grade levels together, was the, was the looping piece. So we'll look for that. We're going to look at the impact of early literacy development in multi-age versus traditional classrooms. So there was one little outlier in early elementary where students are maybe like cracking the code of literacy and reading, learning to read in the first, second grade reading scores where we saw some things we want to double check. So in the next map round, we'll continue looking at that and just watch to see is this, is this better for students who are older? Um, we saw it was great for kids who start off high. They showed great growth, and we saw it was great for kids who don't, who didn't start off high. There was this one little um, anomaly we need to look at with literacy development. We also got some feedback from parents who are like, we love this, and we have no idea what it is. <laughs> so we need to clarify program design, not just for parents, but also internally. Like, we need to do a good job, a better job of communicating internally. Why are we doing this, and what is it? And, um, one of the other things that was really interesting was classroom composition. The perception is the classroom composition was a lot of kids who started off in the higher quartiles in reading and math. The actual data shows that the class composition matches traditional classrooms. So there was no difference when we started off. So we need to communicate those things, right? We need to work on, um, on the purpose and, and what they can expect. Um, we also then, once we design the Communication, then we need to we need to deliver that effectively. And you know that that's not just like a lot of text, right? We need videos, we need information, and those sorts of things. So 
Before I move on to the next thing, are there any questions that are fresh on the mind about about um, looking or multi-age? Erica. So first, I'm going to say thank you that we are on the same page because I literally wrote down social emotional and then you went to that slide. So yeah. um, how many classrooms do we have now that are currently doing this? Seven. Seven. And so, and then the data that you provide the links for, will that outline how the next targeted range is determined? So when you said, like, if a student scores X, then it'll tell them the next time they take that same test or they are assessed, they have another range. Is right. there something in the data that you gave us that we'll talk about how the next like, range is determined? Well, maybe not how it's determined. I can get you that information. Okay. Um, Molly has put together a beautiful executive summary that will give the board so awesome. you can kind of read what's been collected. Um, and then from here, we'll just continue adding columns, right? Like, all right, what's the next nap map data say? And what do those patterns look like? And are these things holding true? But in terms of like how the growth targets are set, I can get you that. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. So you said you're going to continue offering this as an option. Yes. Okay, is this something that a parent can select or is yeah. it something that teachers see in their kids and they say, hey, I think this child would be perfect for the multi-age? That is a really great question. In fact, one of the pieces that we didn't include was looking at kind of a learner profile. Like what type of learner does best in a traditional classroom and what type of learner does best in kind of this multi-age or looping situation. Um, and utilizing the Clifton strengths for that to help us really clarify, and I'm going to get into that with the math piece next, like are there certain talents, like influencer talents or competitive talents, we just go like the computers in there, you know, that rise to the top. Um, currently, if somebody is interested in it, the principals do a great job of balancing classes. So we want our class compositions to be representative of the school as a whole. Um, we try not to do a lot of classroom requests. I don't know if you guys remember, but like 10 years ago or so, we would get like 400 requests. And they're not based in anything other than just like grocery store chatter or something. Um, so we tend not to do requests, but absolutely we have conversations with parents about, well, this is what the program would look like and how it might work. When we first started our first classrooms, um, we had two classrooms at both elementary schools. We did a lot of individualized calls. So it was kind of like a class list was made as it is made for all the classes. And then we made a lot of one-on-one -on -one calls, like we're going to try something new. This is what it would look like. Are you interested in, you know, here's the research as to why. Are you interested in that? Is this something you think your child would enjoy? And when we first started, you've noticed 2019, that's pre-pandemic, right? We didn't have computers. You might not remember that. We only have four computers in the back of every classroom and there was no Wi-Fi. <laughs> and so we were like, and, and we're going to have more computers in the classroom. So just want to make sure you're all okay with that. We're going to have Chromebooks. <laughs> it, was like a, it was like a whole thing, right? It was like just kidding. Everyone's getting one. Um, so a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations. And now we have students and parents to tell those stories because they've been a part of the program. Oh, yeah. So what grades do you start at kindergarten or is it? Yes, we have 1K1 um, and then we have 1-2 and actually each school's got a little bit different based on size. So um, like next year we're not going to have the exact same spread as we do this year um, just because of cohort size. So, but we uh, do start at kindergarten. Yeah, and I think um, the kindergarten was the least desirable <laughs> multi-age, right? Like kindergarten is kind of their own animal. Um, and so, so yeah, otherwise, otherwise, yes, every other grade level has at least one. And then the, you said academically it represents an average yeah. answer, right? What about with diversity? Is it the same? Yeah, so diversity, I mean, we are just not a super diverse community. We would love to increase diversity. Um, and so they're reflective of the other classrooms and in terms of behavior data also reflected however our year two looping data would show decrease in behavior and discipline referrals as well yeah but when we start it's, they start out equal that's a whole process right where it's like boy 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 girl girl like <laughs> when we're making the class list and reading levels and all of it yeah and then how long do they do so currently, we have only done two years. We do have a cohort that's going to do three next year. There is a group that's going to stay with their teacher another year. So, actually, wait, did Miss Simmons also do three? She had three. Yeah. My third year is with team right now. 
I have a third so year with me have, right now. So we'll okay. have two sets of three. Two sets of three. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, if there's no other questions, the last program that we're going to talk about tonight is personalized pace math. I don't have near as many cute pictures. <laughs> um, so what is personalized pace math? It is one math option at Matching High School. Um, and in this option, it allows students to move through content more flexibly upon mastery. So it's more of an individualized pace or personalized pace. Um, it utilizes small group instruction and online tools for immediate feedback. There's an increased emphasis in goal setting, individualized instruction, and incorporating strengths and increased self-advocacy. In other words, students have a pacing guide, they work toward accomplishing that and their own self-set goals, they conference with the teacher, they check in regularly to make sure that they're on pace, um, and they get a lot of immediate feedback utilizing teacher and computer-based tools. And the purpose for this is just to provide another option for different learning styles. Um, some of our students are moving through math and acquiring it at a more rapid pace than they would in a traditional setting, um, which allows them to take more math classes. We have kids who just really love math. Ryan, Liz, Tim's kid loves math. Yeah, so it allows them to take more classes because there's not something holding that space in their schedule. So they can take more math. They can also take other classes if they would like to. Um, so it just gives them more options. It also is more project-based, so the application of the math is typically demonstrated in some type of applied way, where students are utilizing the concepts that are in the modules to do some type of a project. Why would we do this? What research? So again, it wasn't something that just got kind of made up, right? There's a lot of research supporting, first of all, the influences on learning. So um, John Hattie did a meta-analysis of all the things that affect kids as learners. And this program incorporates four of the top 10. So personalized pace affects achievement. And we see um, that all the way from elementary actually up. Um, it's just easier to structure with high schoolers. And then goal setting and feedback in a blended model. There's a ton of research on that as well. So those were the core research principles we utilized to design this year's format of personal space. So what are we finding? Um, again, thanks to Molly for all your amazing number crunching. And uh, every time I'm like, well, what if we, it's like, oh, that's a whole other spreadsheet. <laughs> She's amazing. Um, but we looked at quantitative and qualitative data. So just to really condense it all down, on average, students in a personalized pace math demonstrate more growth on math compared to both traditional and honors, regardless of their starting score. And it needs to be noted that these are, these are uh, a sample from the same teacher. So that teacher doesn't only teach personalized pace, she's teaching other types of math. But what it shows us is that when the right students are in that class, they're, dim they're seeing larger growth so remember the risk score that we talked about earlier, they're seeing, they saw five points difference, um, whereas you can see the honors in the traditional growth as well. Beyond academics though, like what are we finding qualitatively? Um, we found that personalized pace and honors one students scored similarly on the end of semester survey related to their confidence in themselves as mathematicians, their awareness of who they are as learners, their preferences, and how often they're utilizing math resources or other resources available to them outside the classroom. Um, so there really were, it, it was very similar. Um, we did see some really cool things with Clifton Strengths um, that I didn't include in here because it's kind of fresh data, but we found that students with influencer traits as they're in their top um, had incredibly significant growth. Like theirs was like 11 points, um, second only to people with relational strength as in their top, I think that was like eight. So they totally beat the average, right? So it helps for students to know what those talents are and how to use them effectively in the classroom. So what does this mean? We recognize that our learners have a lot of different preferences and needs, and we think it's really good to offer multiple options, multiple pathways, as long as people are informed about what those pathways are. So we continue, we plan on continuing to offer that. 
We have a really successful screening process in place and a structured enrollment process. So everybody knows what they're getting into when they get into it, right? Like that was um, something I think was really beneficial this year. And even, you know, being able to make personalized phone calls and say this is what it looks like. Starts in eighth grade, right? Eighth grade teachers are saying these students are working ahead or they need more time. Um, this traditional pace doesn't really work for this learner. So those would be kids that we recommended. We build a class, we talk with their parents and the students to make sure it's a good fit. We also plan as a result of this study to increase awareness of Clifton strengths and learner dispositions required for the maximum benefit in this class. So basically creating a learner profile. If you, X, Y, Z, you may benefit from this type of learning. Again, you need to make that decision for yourself, but just giving that information up front. Um, Continue weekly progress reports, feedback, and goal setting processes. This is super tightly done. Um, Ms. Woods at the high school has done a really great job of just really standardizing this, and the goal setting is incredibly impressive. Um, if you're ever on one of our learning walks and you're in the high school, I encourage you to visit. It's just a really neat um, process, and students are definitely self directed. We also want to analyze SAT data this year just to see what that dip, what those differences, if any, exist. And then, of course, continue to look at math data. So you'll notice that multi-age, that program review went back to 2019. We're doing this for this year, so we we're looking at like two pieces of really, it's hard to make a lot of claims yet. But our early signs are very promising. So we'll continue looking at that. And then we'll continue seeking student and parent feedback, like what did you like, what didn't you like, what worked well, what didn't work well. And we did that last year and it helped us make some adjustments for this year's format as well. So these are our next steps. Um, gray is for everywhere. Uh, we feel like we need to investigate additional opportunities for looping and those conversations are happening with principals right now, like they've been happening all semester. What are ways that we can increase looping opportunities um, naturally that would not disrupt the um, overall system of the day. We also need to increase communication um, around multi-age looping program inside and purpose. Here's our math, what we want to do for math next steps. And then overall, like this is just something if you go back to our initial paradigm, continuing analyzing data for patterns and then applying that, uh, that's something we'll just continue to do regardless of the innovation we're talking about. So that's what I have, what questions or comments? So with this type of math, is there a teacher yes. readily available? So if they're struggling, they can at least... Yes. So um, you guys are in there all the time. Um, yes, there is. There's a structured, it's a workshop model. So there's kind of whole group, small group, individual, whole group. And during that small group, individual work, uh, the teacher is pulling students who are either not progressing, whose feedback checks are not <coughs> on par, um, there's still teacher assessment being done. And so if there's students that are scoring low on assessments, she'll pull those students. Um, but yes, there's regular teacher direct instruction. The difference is it happens in response to student work as opposed to just everybody's going to get it regardless if you need it or not. So, it, so that's what we call formative mm -hmm. feedback because they've done something that's informed me on what I need to do as a teacher. It's a lot like coaching, right? Like you, you wouldn't just like talk about free throws, you would have them do it, you'd watch and then you'd know what you needed to, to coach. At least that's what I hear. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, we just started a basketball coach. I know! <laughs> Probably second grade is going to be sometime, right? <laughs> but does that answer your question? Yes, there is a teacher in the room. She's fantastic. Yeah. I have a lot of managing a lot of things. Thank you. Yeah. It's ninth grade right now. Like, are you expanding that to... Um, I think that, that those conversations are happening, right? Like when we talk about looping again, there's this notion of like what happens if these students stay in, in the same cohort. Um, I think there's interest in additional cohorts. I think there's a crop of new students coming to the high school that have an interest. And you guys yeah. this by the I mean, that's, uh, you did a really good job, good job in the presentation. Uh, we take all the feedback that we get from parents and students and we listen and we evaluate and we reflect on how can we best utilize that to ultimately create the best programming for our students. And last year we took a lot of feedback as we did this with all freshman students. And some students struggled with that for a variety of reasons. But instead of saying, hey, this is terrible, really 
reflected on that data and it was like, well, it wasn't terrible for these students. So how can we make sure we put these students that identify and uh, thrive in a more traditional setting? Because that's what we want, the best results possible for every kid. So we broke that out and gave options and did a much better job of informing, structuring, pacing, feedback, evaluation. I could go on for a long time. A lot of time and thought that it was invested into this with a lot of staff help and support with that. So we have more students coming to the high school that had this in eighth grade or had an experience with it and that are identifying with that. And we have some students that were in traditional, but they're very interested in this idea of being able to have a little bit more control over their pace and their experiences. And really, it's a really cool blended model. And that's what some of the research you'll see if you look at that, that blended learning model. So it was listening to students and parents and breaking that out to there's options. Not everybody's going to have to do it this way. Not everybody's going to have to do it that way. We want kids to be able to find and parents find that best fit. I think that's a really important point. And, and really the whole purpose of this is because if we're going to try new things, we've got to check mm -hmm. and respond to them. And it's not to say that any of this is better than any of the other stuff. Right? Like, it's not to say multi-age is better than. It's saying we dared to try multi-age, so we need to be responsible to see what the effect is. Right? We dared to try personalized pace. We need to see what the effect is. Our traditional classrooms and those experiences are still good. Could they incorporate the powerful elements that we're seeing for some of this research? Probably. Possibly. But then we would need to check that, too. So, are you looking um, at it for different... Subjects also? Yeah, actually, this really cool. We brought that up this year. We talked like our English department is very interested in it. Um, obviously, teaching English and teaching math are like I mean, very different. Um, and so, figuring out what that might look like, we don't have a strong program design ready to try on that yet. But people are warm to the idea, um, and I think it really goes to show that support they feel for innovating and trying to meet their learners where they are and being progressive, responsive teachers um, who want their kids engaged. And they feel that support where they wouldn't be trying these things. So, and that's from all levels. Yeah. Heidi, I did just want to clarify one thing. So while it is mostly freshmen, we do have a good number of sophomores that are in the class that, that were offered it last year and, and we're on board with wanting to take it. So it's not an all freshman class. There are several sophomores in there as well. Mm -hmm. So some of them would have had me last year, but some of them had her last year and then have her again, just depending on which sophomore it is. It'd be interesting to see after multiple years what that looks mm -hmm. like. Any other questions? Okay, thanks for having me on so long. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Having no further district business, I need a motion to move into executive session at 8.02. I'm sorry, Erica. Second. Second by Ashley. Okay. Okay. Hedges? Yes. Kathleen? Yes. Larson? Overton? Yes. Ryder? Yes. And Weaver? Yes. Yeah, we'll stay in here and we'll probably resume here at 8.10. Um, but as, uh, as we said, there's no action. So after executive session, we'll Thank you, folks. Have a good night. Be safe out there.